Cool. So uh, I'll start us off in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, this space that we have to meet together, Lord. Whether we're in person or we're virtual, Lord, we know that when two are gathered in uh, your name, you are present in the midst of us, Lord. Um, Lord, I ask that you bless me, that you may speak through me, Father, that it may not be my own thoughts, but um, what is pleasing to you and what honors you and brings glory to you, Father. Um, I ask that you bless this message, that it um, may help those that are that are in school now, which is, of course, all of them, Lord, that um, it may help grow their, their character and their patience, Father, as they um, finish out the remainder of, of their time at Stevens and into whatever other glorious plans that you have for their lives. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Cool. So uh, the title that I actually thought would be fitting to the specific things that I'm going to be talking about are Trials, Tests, and Tribulation. This is on connecting four years of college to God. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to start out with is uh, a, an open-ended question kind of to all of you guys. Why, why are you in school right now? What are some reasons that you're either at Stevens or why are you in school right now? You guys feel free to unmute yourselves or throw it in the chat or whatever you're comfortable with. There's no wrong answers. To get a job. I couldn't hear you. If you don't have any, don't worry. There's no pressure on this. Just, uh, I don't know if you guys have, it, it's not an existential question, but um, I just have some points uh, that I'll, I'll bring up when, when I think of school in general. Um, when we're, when we're pursuing our degree, when we're, when we're studying our majors, we are trying to learn specific subjects that are going to aid in our work after graduation. So we never just want to get a degree. It's not something that we just simply want to have so that we could put on our wall. Um, and in the very same way, God doesn't want us to just simply go through the motion of something so that we just get a piece of paper. But uh, God wants us to specifically work hard to make a living in a way that honors him. Um, one of the first examples I could possibly think of of someone working hard is the Apostle Paul, perhaps the greatest evangelist of all time. Um, he made tents. That was his job. That's how he earned his keep. And he writes specifically into his letters that even when he would go and visit all of these different churches and all of these different peoples, he was never a burden on them. He wasn't coming there and simply saying, you know, I'm, I'm spreading the word of Christ. So, you know, just give me food. He was working with his hands to do something that honored God so that he wouldn't be a burden on his brothers. So one of the um, one of the other things, this is really one of the highlights of going to college is it teaches you how to think, right? So you're growing as an individual because we encounter numerous difficult experiences and problems throughout our time at Stevens. Um, regardless of what your major is, um, you're going to start to learn the mindset of how to approach every new problem and predicament um, and basically everything that happens throughout Stevens and thereafter um, with the skills that you're fostering now. And uh, you develop critical thinking. Um, and simultaneously, you're growing friendships that last a lifetime. Um, and when it comes down to it, you're embarking on a roughly four to six year project and you're seeing it through to completion. And then once you graduate, you receive a degree um, signifying that the race has been finished and it attests to your competence and it verifies your capabilities and that it's known the struggles and the difficulties and how much you need to grow throughout your, um, throughout your time in college. So it verifies that you are indeed capable of what your degree stands for. Now, the three things that I specifically want to address and talk about today are going to be the trials, the tests, and the tribulations that we experience um, both in school and that the Lord puts us through to grow us. So we'll start off with trials. And there's really three words that come to mind when I think of trials. It's um, an experiment, an experience, or an examination. One of the things that we're going to see is that trials and tests are very closely linked. Even when they're mentioned scripturally, when we dive into the scriptures, we're going to see that um, they're usually mentioned in tandem with one another um, because testing is a form of a trial. So if we actually look at the word trial, it comes from the word try from Anglo-French. Um, the verb was trier, T-R-I-E-R, -E which means to try. So you're trying it out. So this could be any effort or exertion 
of strength for the purposes as, of ascertaining its effects or what can be done. That's also a dictionary definition. For example, in this fine man that is moving this boulder up the hill, it is a trial to see if he has, it's a trial of strength. The trial is to see and ascertain if we'll be able to have the strength to lift the boulder up the mountain. So first, if we look at a trial in school, some trials can be way out there. If you try taking 32 credits in a given semester, that would be a ridiculous trial. I mean, good luck. But um, that's, that's definitely a trial that would involve um, an excessive and rigorous course load for that semester. Um, a trial could be changing study habits so that you're studying more frequently. Um, it could be something like tutoring, um, you know, getting extra help in tutoring. Um, and then finally, obviously, testing is a form of a trial. Um, but in all of these, when you're, when you're going through all of these differences, you are growing your character in the interim. Every single trial that you experience in school, um, it increases studiousness. It, it increases attentive to course material, taking what's necessary from a course and understanding coursework. You're growing as an individual through these trials of school. Well, that's no different than the kind of trials that we have with the Lord. I think, yes, I do have a picture. Um, this is actually uh, a very um, creative depiction of what happened in Exodus, which we're going to be talking about a little bit. So the first verse that I'm going to read is in James 1. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Um, another word in some other translations is patience. Um, so the, the thing that I want to note when we go through all of the scriptures that we're going to be looking at today, there's always a mention of joy or rejoicing when we hear trials and testing, which almost on the surface seems counterintuitive. It's like, don't you know that I'm going to be undergoing a lot? I could have stress and anxiety and worries. But if I read it again, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Um, and then it continues into James 1, 3 to 4. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So one of the big themes that is uh, prevalent throughout the Bible, when we're undergoing a trial, whether it's in school or whether it's in life, um, one of the most important things that we can have is patience. Um, and patience isn't something that just develops. When we pray to the Lord for patience, he doesn't simply give us patience. He puts us, puts us in situations such that patience can grow. And trials are one of the biggest areas of our life because things aren't immediately being fixed. Things aren't immediately being handed to us. Whether it's school, if you have um, a big test coming up, if you have anything with your family, um, if there's a stressful situation, if it's financial, all of those different trials are going to produce in you patience. Um, and then in James 1.12, a little bit further on, it said, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So the reason that we're given trials is not simply to give us trials, just because God wants us to uh, undergo trials for the sake of it. The goal of the trials that the Lord gives us in our lives is to grow our character and to develop us as individuals that are equipped for every single good work that he has for us. We know that the Lord has plans that are better for us than we can possibly imagine. And what these trials actually produce in you, the Lord will use school, the Lord will use your life situations to grow your character into the person that he created you to be. And we could see that it's very clear that if you remain steadfast under trial, um, when you've stood the test, you'll receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. This is a promise. The, the crown of life that we receive when we meet God to face to face, that is a promise that he gives to us um, because of his faithfulness to us when we simply submit to him. And uh, talking more about submitting to the Lord in the face of trials, I'm going to go to Exodus 14. I'm just going to set the stage for you real quick. So um, the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, and they were led out um, into the wilderness. And again, some amazing things are happening. They're being led by a ring of fire um, at, during the night and, and where their camps are tented out. There's a fog that covers them or uh, smoke that covers them during the day. The Lord is so present in the midst of them. The Lord is leading them into the wilderness. 
right? So the wilderness is not a place where they'd be able to survive out on their own. They're in the desert. They're, 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 um, they're not living in the lush lands of the promised lands, uh, which is where the Lord is taking them to, but they're in the wilderness right now. And then, boom, Pharaoh sees that all of the Israelites are left, and he's envious because they were working for him for free because they were slaves. So the, if you look at the actual quantity of individuals, there are 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. Imagine thousands of people are charging at you in the wilderness. So I think it's fair to say that the Jewish people, are the Israelites, are in the midst of a trial at this point. Um, and uh, it's very interesting because the Lord had already brought them out of Egypt. The Lord was so clearly with them. Um, and this is really where the trial starts. It's going to start in Exodus 14, verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? It's kind of a snarky comment. It's like, you brought us out here to die? That's literally what they're saying. Um, what have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. They're literally saying, isn't it better if we were just slaves in Egypt? Um, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to them, and this is the key point, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which we, he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent. And in some other stand, translations, um, it says to be still. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent, or you need only be still. So when we're in the midst of these trials and we're overwhelmed, we're being attacked from all sides, whether it's with stress or anxiety or whatever situation and predicament that the trial of life has us in, that is the answer. To wait on the Lord, our strength is found in him. The Lord is the one that is going to bring us through every single one of these trials because he is sovereign over all things. It is not by our strength that we're going to overcome the trials in our lives, but by his strength. And that is the great hope. Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. The Lord is going to be the one in every trial, in every tribulation, in every test, who is going to be bringing you through. So the key thing that we have to take away from here is patience. That when things are overwhelming, we need to be patient and wait on the Lord. Being faithful, obviously faithful to our studies, working hard, doing all of the things and upholding all the responsibilities he's given to us. But our hope is in the Lord and our strength is in the Lord. So um, the last point that I have about trials is in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. Trial and test. Um, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you, also, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So every time that there's trials and every time that there's testing, there's rejoicing. Um, it's worth the wait. Our strength and our hope is in the Lord. The Lord is the one that brings us through these. And we are forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. The amazing, amazing plans that the Lord has for our lives and his presence in our lives. And he will single-handedly bring us through these trials. So then the next point is testing. Got this nice, um, I see all your faces got orange now because of the, uh, <laughs> the bright orange fire. This is actually gold being refined by fire. And this is a very, um, very common um, metaphor that the Bible uses that we, our faith gets tried by fire. Now the process of refining gold is it's heated up to extremely, incredibly high temperatures such that all the impurities are burned out. Um, it is a trial by fire, um, and that is the way in which uh, gold and other metals are made pure. It is by heating them up and exposing them to, uh, I mean, from a human perspective, uncomfortable conditions such that they may become pure. Um, so, uh, let me just double check. I'm running two PowerPoints right now, so bear with me. Be 
Beautiful. So testing. Um, as you guys probably are aware right now, you're most likely in the midst of midterms or um, you're, you're currently taking tests. So tests in general are procedures intended to establish the quality, performance, or reliability of something, especially before it is taken into widespread use. Obviously, if you're going to build bridges, it, you would hope that someone was tested on their ability to build bridges, um, their understanding of physics, their understanding of materials, before they went out and started building bridges. Um, so uh, the verse that I would love to, to point to in regards to testing um, is Revelation 3.18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. So when the Lord tells us to buy from him gold refined by fire, he's talking about faith because the most precious thing that we have is our faith in him. Our faith is what allows us to do the impossible. Jesus said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all three things are possible. And in fact, the tests that the Lord puts in our lives are what purify our faith, and they increase um, our proximity and our closeness to the Lord, which is why we can have rejoicing in the midst of testing and trials, because he is the one that is leading us through the trials, and he is the one that is passing the tests for us. Um, really, every single test that we give is, do you trust me? It's the Lord saying, do you trust me? Are you going to trust me with this? I know you can't see the end of this. I know that you, you, you feel a little bit hopeless right now, but do you trust me that out of all the past things I've delivered you from, that I am able to bring you through this one? And that is the purification process. That is the process by which the Lord burns out all of the impurities in us so that our faith may become pure. And it actually, the faith that is developed is more precious than gold. It is the most precious thing we have, our trust and our faith in the Lord. So um, coming back to that, we're going to look at that, um, that verse in James 1-2 again. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or it produces patience. When your faith is tested, you develop patience. You develop patience in waiting on what the Lord has in store. Um, you're able to be free of stress and anxieties, it says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends understanding will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. Regardless of the trial, regardless of the test, when you are being tested, it produces patience. It, the same thing happens in Stevens. The same thing happens when in your academic career. When you are undergoing a test, you're studying, you're spending late nights, you are building your character in order to equip you to prepare to tackle problems in the real world when things arise. Um, these are growing your character and your patience, which are two of the most critical things. Really, as we continue in this, you're gonna see that the two most critical points of, um, of any trials or tests that the Lord puts you through are character and patience. And then finally, the final part that I have about testing is uh, in 2 Corinthians 12:9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What a beautiful statement. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. This is not of our own strength. There's not going to be a time in our lives where a great trial and test comes upon us. And by our own strength, we're able to pull ourselves through it. But it is in those moments that his grace is sufficient for us. Because when we are weak, the Lord is strong because we turn to him and we lean on him. That he may grow in us the people that he created us to be as he refines our faith by fire. And then tribulation. Um, I could not bring myself to put a sad picture for tribulation. Um, because in all seriousness, Tribulations from the very start, if we define that, it's a cause of great trouble or suffering. But tribulation is designed to bring us back to God. It is when we're in great suffering, great agony, um, in every situation of life, that that is designed to bring us to God. Did you notice how um, there's, there's old sayings? I know that they exist in Polish, but it's basically like as soon as life gets tough, everyone becomes a praying man. Um, 
that it is in these great tribulations that they're designed to draw us back to the Lord. And in fact, not only are tribulations uh, likely to happen in your life, they're promised. Uh, in John 16, 33, Jesus says this, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You will have it. You're going to experience some really tough things. We live in a fallen world. The effects of sin are all around us. You're going to find tribulation in everything from your schoolwork um, throughout your four years. It could be a class that you're, uh, you're finding impossible to pass. You're spending hours and hours and days and weeks on it. There could be a family situation. There could be the loss of a loved one. Regardless of the situation, tribulations will arise in your life. And uh, that's a promise. Um, and then Romans 12.2 um, gives the perfect solution to what happens when we have tribulations in our life. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Do we see how closely patience and tribulation, patience and trials, patience and testing are? Um, it's one of the most uncomfortable virtues. We've probably heard it for, since we were a kid. Patience is a virtue. It's one of the most uncomfortable virtues to have because as humans, we like to have everything in control of our lives. You guys all go to Stevens. You're all very bright and capable individuals um, and you want to hold everything close to your heart actually being patient and waiting on the lord is so difficult because we're waiting on him we're waiting on him to bring us through trials we're waiting on his strength we're waiting on what his plan is for our life rather than trying to make it happen under our own might and our own strength be patient in tribulation um, and then right before that rejoice in hope it doesn't matter if you're going through a tribulation or a test or a trial for the Lord is your salvation and he will deliver you. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation and be constant in prayer. And then my last point on tribulation is more than that, uh, this is Romans 5, 3 to 5. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts, the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So this is such a beautiful little chain. Suffering produces endurance. When we're going through trials, when we're going through tests, when we're going through sufferings, that produces endurance and that produces patience. And that endurance is what produces character. All of these things that you're doing in Stevens right now, the late nights that you're spending, the intense studying that you're doing, the tests that you're taking, all of the work that you're doing now is not in vain because you're growing a character that is so precious that is worth more than the education that you're paying for because it's growing you into the people that are able to take on all of the things that the Lord has planned for you. Another reason that you're tested, you know, in engineering is so that you could do something in the field of work that you wish to go into to a high quality level such that you're trusted and that you're able to successfully carry out the tasks that you have. Well, in the same way, when the Lord tests us, he wants to test certain areas of our life so that we may be strong in those areas, that he may use us in those areas. Because if we're not tested and we're not tried, we would be extremely and incredibly weak. I have a really cool example to give uh, in two slides about this. So the last one that I really wanted to tie everything all together with, I know these are such uh, sad words, trying, testing, and trials, testing, and tribulation. I picked the happiest possible topics I could go through. Um, but the, the most beautiful things are joy, peace, and thanksgiving that can come even in the midst of trials, um, because that is what produces patience and character. So in Psalm 73, it says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Um, and then in Isaiah 40, 31, but they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And then 1 Peter 5.10, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. You see, in all of these, this is not us pulling ourselves out of situation. In, our, in the first verse, our flesh and our heart fail, but the Lord's strength is what carries us through. The second one, but they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. It's that patience that is uh, that, that waiting on the Lord for him to act in our lives that is bringing us through. And then the third one, after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. 
This is the work of the Lord as we grow in faith for him, as we consistently turn to the cross and focus our eyes on Christ. That is where our strength is found. It is not found in ourselves, but it is found in God alone. So if there's any really big takeaway that um, you can have from anything that I'm saying tonight, it's when you graduate from Stevens and you're kind of reminiscing and looking back on what you learned, um, you're going to notice a couple things. The first is God's faithfulness and how he has carried you through so many situations and so many difficulties that you face throughout your college years. And then from the personal perspective, he is training you in patience and growing your character, which profoundly affects your mindset and your lifestyle. That prepares you to be a good husband or a wife. That prepares you to be an effective member in the workforce. And that, that prepares you to be a powerful tool that can be used by God to touch the souls that he's placed in your life. You're developing habits that make you distinct. And with that, college is not the ending by any means. It is the beginning. The learning doesn't stop when college ends. In the same way that learning never stops in our walk with God, we're rooted in the word. We're, we're, we're reading the word every day such that we draw closer to him so we can ascertain what his will is for our lives. It is his wisdom, his grace that get us through every trial, test, and tribulation that he's prepared for us. Um, and also, before I move on to my last slide, last slide, <laughs> the Lord has more in store for you than just trials, tests, and tribulations. Um, I just figured this would be a good thing to touch on, given that you're most likely in midterms time. But the Lord has also prepared blessings, peace, joy, and hope for you. But the most important thing to remember is that the faith that you develop for the Lord in the tough times is as much needed in the good times as when you were in those tough times. The Polish saying exists, like I mentioned before, because everyone becomes a praying man when times are tough. It is very easy to lose sight of the glory of the Lord and the beauty of all that he does in our lives when things are good. The faith that we develop in the tough times is so important to carry us through um, because it is in him alone that we hope in and it is in him alone that is our strength. Our strength doesn't come from ourselves. Um, so the, the importance is in those good times that we know who the real joy giver is, the real hope giver, and the real peace giver is. So with that, I have a really cool story to share. So um, this is, this is going to be my closing remark. So I had a silly little project that I did. Um, I grew silkworm eggs into silkworms, and I harvested them for their silk, and I made friendship bracelets. Um, and it was a, it's an incredibly long and extensive process. I needed to pick mulberry leaves every single day. I went down to the Elysian Park, which is next to Stevens, because that's the only mulberry tree in Hoboken. And I picked mulberry leaves every single day, and I fed my worms, and they grow. And boom, look at these guys. I got one coming out of the cocoon on the left, and I got when he's fully hatched out on the right. I actually posted this on TikTok, and it got 1.1 million views, which is ridiculous. But there's a beautiful lesson here. So if you found a moth or a butterfly in a cocoon, um, and before it hatched, you just cut it out and you allowed it to continue its life cycle outside of its cocoon, um, you've done it a tremendous disservice and it most likely won't be able to fly because it is actually the act of that butterfly emerging. It has to struggle. It has to break its way out of that cocoon that actually gives it the strength to develop those muscles that it needs to fly. So in fact, if you just cut the butterfly out of the cocoon, it won't have the strength to actually be able to fly. So I actually saw that this little moth on the left um, was a very weak moth. I don't believe he had any eggs. Um, whereas the one on the right struggled his way out of the cocoon. Um, and it's the same way in our lives. The Physical working of our situations and giving them to the Lord is building the muscles that we need to actually grow into the people that he created us to be. So trials, tribulations, and testing are necessary, and they're all designed so that we fix our eyes in the right place, that we fix our eyes on the cross, and that we may rely on his strength alone, developing patience and character in the midst of it. Um, so that is everything that I have for you guys. Thank you so much. And now I will pause for... Uh, if you guys have any questions. Yeah. Sorry? 
Thank you. Absolutely. Praise God. Um, I guess I was going to also use this as an opportunity because I, um, I, I wanted to see if you guys did have any questions about this, but I would love to share a little tiny bit of my testimony. I don't know if any of you guys have heard my testimony. I know some of you may have, um, but I'd just kind of love to open up a little bit about how I came to know Christ. Um, and you most likely will have some questions for me afterwards. So um, I'll, I'll just kind of bring a condensed version um, for you guys. So um, I came to college as not a Christian. I was agnostic at best, um, most likely an atheist. And um, I was a very arrogant child. Um, I began partying. I began drinking a lot. And I had the mindset that I could do everything. I could party. I could have a girlfriend. I could get good grades in school. And what I ended up doing was I got involved with uh, drugs. Um, someone offered me Oxycontin, and that started me on a path to becoming heavily addicted to multiple substances. Um, so basically for about nine months, I abused every possible substance imaginable. Um, I became addicted to heroin, Adderall, and I was abusing mushrooms, experimental pharmaceuticals, and basically every possible chemical um, you can imagine. And one day I woke up, after about nine months of abusing substances, and I knew if I didn't stop right there, I would die. Not like, oh, life would be tough. My life would be over. So I quit everything cold turkey. I stopped using absolutely everything altogether. And I went through the worst two weeks of my life. I couldn't walk for two weeks because heroin is physiologically addictive. Um, and then I started having onset psychological um, issues. I developed a panic disorder. I had um, it started with one panic attack a day, and then it went to two panic attacks a day. And I used to have this vision, the thing that kept hanging me up, and the reason I had such anxiety was that I felt that my physical body was here, but my spirit was falling. And no matter how, how hard I tried to, um, to make myself feel better, no matter what I thought of, there was nothing that was removing my anxiety. There was, there was no hope. I felt hopeless. Um, and then one day I was locked outside of, a, uh, of my apartment and there was a guy painting a church with one arm and I offered, I said, Hey, you looks like you're painting all by yourself. Uh, you mind if I give you a hand? So we painted the church together and he invited me in afterwards. And he said, you ever feel like there's something missing in your life? Like you got a lot of things going for you, but there's just something that you keep trying to fill a hole in your heart. And I said, yeah. And he shared with me the gospel. Um, he said, Jesus loved you so much. God loved you so much that he sent his only son. He came down and he suffered and died for you on a cross um, so that you could be saved, um, so that all your sins could be forgiven, so that the hole in your heart could be filled. And in the moment, I was really receptive to it. But as I went outside, it went in one ear and out the other. And I have what I call a fist fight with God. Um, I was fighting. I, I was like, I don't need Jesus. I don't need uh, God in my life. Um, I, I'm, I'm perfectly capable of being a good person all by myself. So I tried everything, transcendental meditation, acupuncture, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Shintoism, Deism, basically everything that involved the performance. If you could, if you could try to do it to be a good person, I've most likely tried it before. Um, and then one day my friend was talking to me um, about multidimensional string theory and how it pertained to Christianity. And it wasn't the words that he said, but it struck my heart like a ton of bricks. Um, and I was convicted of the truth. The vision that I had, that my physical body was here, but my spirit was falling, came rushing into my eyes. And I knew that this was the truth. Jesus is the son of God, and he suffered and died for me on the cross. Whether or not I chose to believe in that didn't change whether or not it was the truth. It only changed whether the fact, whether or not I got to be with him. So that night, as the most broken human being on the planet, I got on my knees and I said, Lord, I trust you are who you say you are. I am the most broken, wretched, miserable person on the planet. If anyone can fix me, it's you. And I trust that you are who you say you are and that you can save me. And I preface this next part by saying that this happened with me. This doesn't happen with everybody. But um, my anxiety went away in a week. Um, I've never had a panic attack since I became a believer. Um, because what would end up happening is as those anxious thoughts began to, ero began to arise and I was so aware of my sin and the brokenness inside of me, um, there was Jesus saying, this is why I died for you. I love you so much that I died for you. There is nothing too great that, that I cannot take upon me. 
Um, and the Lord systematically went through all areas of my life and cleaned them up. I was living with my ex-girlfriend at the time. Um, he cleaned up my relationship. He took away sexual immorality, which absolutely strengthened and grew our relationship and, and actually increased our closeness by walking in holiness. Um, and then the Lord has just so abundantly blessed me. My, my ministry, praise the Lord, is with homeless people because um, especially a lot of them are addicted to substances. Um, I know what they're going through and uh, I have a special place in my heart for them. Um, but I went from having like, I don't know, my GPA was horrible before to I started taking school seriously. Um, and the Lord has just so abundantly blessed my life with everything from, um, I now run a business, Hudson Dorms. Um, I got accepted to med school. Um, it was uh, Drexel University College of Medicine um, from someone that was literally around like a 2.7 GPA, uh, not studying, arrogant kid. Um, everything I have comes from the Lord. There's nothing that I have that did not come from him. And he has absolutely changed my life. Um, so I could tell you for a fact that speaking about peace in the midst of trials and peace in the midst of tribulations, it's so true. There is no point that is too low for you not to have the peace of the Lord. If you trust Christ, you will get rich, just not temporarily. Not, not, it won't be money, but it'll be spiritually because our treasure is stored up in heaven where, uh, where thieves and vermin do not break in and kill and destroy. Um, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be, be also. When we trust in Christ, he changes our lives. And uh, that is the only way upon which we could find peace in the midst of uncertainty and in the midst of chaos, because he is the one that overcame and he is the one that changes hearts and lives. Praise be to God. Thank you, guys. Amen, bro. Do you, uh, is there any trial that comes to your mind that you're like, you know, if I didn't know God, I would have to act in a totally different way. But, you know, since you have the hope, it's just kind of changed you. Amen. <laughs> That's, yeah. So this happened two weeks ago. Um, I was parked in my car and, um, this is, this is more of a test than a trial, but someone backed up and they like bumped my car. I was parked, I was eating Panera bread and I got really annoyed. And I just kind of like put my hand up like, hey, and like all I needed was just a hand, like my bad, I'm sorry. And she starts mocking me with her hands in the mirror. Uh, like when I looked out into her car. So I get out of my car and I go up to her window and she rolls down the window and she is livid. She starts freaking out at me and yelling at me. And I say, look, like, you hit my car. And she finally apologized. She's like, yeah, I'm sorry I hit your car. And I'm like, oh, stop. That's all I wanted to hear. And, um, and I asked her, I'm like, are you having a bad day? And she, like, stops dead in her tracks. And she says, and she starts tearing up. And she's like, I'm having a really bad day. And, like, my heart melted. My heart absolutely melted. And uh, she confessed to me that one of her best friends had just passed away. And she was actually going over to make funeral arrangements with another friend. And uh, she was crying at this point. So I just said, hey, can I pray for you? And I got to pray for this random lady that hit my car in the middle of Hoboken. And um, she was crying. I had tears in my eyes. And uh, just what a beautiful situation that the Lord was able to turn around and, and use for his glory. Because me, the arrogant kid that I used to be, would have said some really pointed, horrible, terrible, offensive things to this lady. And I would have just served to make her day so much worse. We don't know what anyone is going through. When we're receptive to the Lord, he can use so many situations for our glory when we're receptive to him. Um, and a lot of times that involves sacrificing self. I wanted to yell at this lady, um, but uh, I just, I didn't even think about it. Like, are you having a bad day? She really was having a bad day and praise God that I got to pray for her. So yeah, that was definitely, that was definitely a test that I would not have passed um, had I not had the Lord in my life. <laughs> Great question, Caleb. Caleb took my question, but thank you so much. Thank you so much, TJ. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you, TJ. Thank you, TJ.
Are there any more questions before I close that? I would also like to say, I'm going I'm to add one other thing. Um, so one of the largest growths that I had in my faith, I would say, um, especially in the beginning, because when we come to know Christ, um, we want to be effective in our knowledge of him. Um, and there's many Bible verses that talk about us being effective in, um, in our knowledge of Christ, because when we know the truth, we're called to go out and act on it, to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, I really have a big special thanks to Maz, the one that's on this call right now. Um, Maz was the first person to disciple me, who taught me how to read the word. Um, I am just what an incredible brother, what an incredible um, man who, who follows the Lord and trusts him with everything that he has. And um, I thank so much of, of my growth in the Lord to having Maz in my life. Um, he was my first leader at Teens. It was a really special group. It was just me, Maz, and um, my friend Sam Wilt. It was just the three of us. And um, one of the most important things when we learn about Christ is to deepen our roots, to deepen our roots in the word such that we continue to grow with him because it's not just something like, oh, I've received Christ in my heart. So that's good. I'm good to do whatever I want. No, we want to deepen our roots in him. We want to grow closer to him. We want to learn more about him. So I am forever grateful to, uh, to Maz, and, and he has done so much for my, my growth in Christ. So I praise God that, um, that he uh, has been such an incredible brother. I had another question that I just thought of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you ever feel afraid to share the gospel? And what do you tell yourself or what do you remind yourself when you feel that? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, especially in the beginning... Um, one of my tics, one of my character traits is that I am obsessed with ensuring conversations are perfect. I know that sounds so silly on the outside, but I am a conversationalist perfectionist. In every other area, I'm not a perfectionist. But um, one of the things that I really like is special things that occur that you can use as an opportunity to share God's love that are just so out of the ordinary. One of the biggest ones in my ministry with homeless people, sharing the love of God is so easy when you're giving something away to somebody. Like I'm, I'm giving you a meal um, or if I'm, like if I see someone that's struggling on the street, if you see someone crying, I've walked up to people and said, hey, can I pray for you? It's in those unusual situations in life that it's the easiest. Um, so especially if you ever gave a meal to a homeless person, that's the perfect time to tell them about Jesus. Um, as a conversational perfectionist, I never want to intrude and then just randomly imagine it's like, yeah, I'm a big Knicks fan, you know, and it's like, did you know that Jesus died for your sins? Like, no, I would never do that. Um, but I really like talking about Jesus. And one of the, one of the things is as we grow with him and as we uh, deepen our roots in him, there's just activities that happen in my life. So for example, all of the baristas in town of the coffee shops I go to, like, they'll hear things about either something I learned on Thursday or I'll even share with them, I'll, I'll share with them areas of my life. Um, and especially the way that when you get to know someone, you'll know if they're a fan of something, you know, if they're a sports fan or if they really like to exercise. But one of the things that people should know about you in a relationship, in a friendship, is that you you love Christ because that's, that's my only identity. I'm not anything. I'm not a dancer. I'm not a Frisbee player. I'm not uh, a housing provider. I'm a Christian. My identity is in Christ. Um, so when people meet me, I'm going to have to bring that up because it's like my favorite thing to talk about. Um, and that's going to flow over into those areas of my life. Um, and the biggest thing I would say is there's always, there's going to be opportunities that arise. Um, don't, don't fight the Holy Spirit. If, if you're going to a Bible study later and you say, Hey, what are you doing later today? And then someone's like, oh, I'm doing this. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to a Bible study. I'm really excited about it. I've been feeling a bit dry le lately. I've said that. I'm really excited to the Bible study. I really am looking forward to getting into the Word. I've been feeling dry lately. It's literally, you're not, that's not a forceful conversation topic. It's just a statement about your life because Christ is in your heart. And when we share the gospel, we share it in, obviously, like street evangelism. I wouldn't recommend that to everybody. That still scares me sometimes when I go and street evangelize, like you get some people that say some stuff. Um, but especially in your own personal friendships and your own personal relationships, 
if you're a believer, you're going to have those things built into your life. Don't be afraid to invite them like, hey, I have Stephen's Christian Fellowship tonight. Or, hey, you want to come to church with me on Sunday? Um, in the same way that someone might invite you to a football game. Those aren't weird things to do. Um, and I would, I would, because that's your identity and people know that's you, it would only make sense for you to invite them to something that's important to you. Um, and I guess from a mindset perspective, we're never salesmen. We're not selling Christ. We're not selling the idea of eternal life. We are satisfied custom customers, and it's never our job to change hearts. It's never our job to change minds, but it is our job to share about the joy that fills us. Um, and because it's an aspect of, of who we identify as individuals, um, when, it, when the Holy Spirit shows you a very clear and easy way to bring it up in just a way that explains your life, don't fight that. Because those small little seeds and those small conversations will lead to deeper conversations when you talk with those, um, those friends and those people you've made friendships with later on. Neat. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, great questions, guys. I would highly recommend street evangelism. Um, I would just pick like a verse or like a chapter in the Bible and just read it. Um, it's really hard to ascertain fruit when you're just spreading the gospel on the street, but there's some amazing, incredible conversations. I spoke to a nine-year-old boy and shared the gospel with him um, on the streets of New York, on Christopher Street. Um, and just like the look of awe and wonder in his eyes when he heard about Jesus was one of the most powerful things. So there's so much fruit that can come out of uh, street evangelism. But I don't think, I wouldn't just say like, yeah, you want to spread the gospel? Like, go to Times Square and start sharing Jesus. I would say start with the people that you know and that know that you're a believer. <laughs> All right. I'm sure people might have more questions. going to pour in. But for now, I'm going to just close out the meeting um, with our slides. I'm sure we'll hang around afterwards, of course. But once again, thanks to TJ for that awesome message tonight. Thank you for and having me. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. And for our upcoming meetings for the week, just to recap what we went over in the beginning, tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. is our ladies' breakfast reclaim. Tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. is small groups. Friday evening at 8 p.m. is game night. Sunday evening at 6.20 p.m. is 18.20, our prayer night. And you can come back here next Wednesday for our next GVM. And that speaker will be Justin Michael. He'll be talking about dealing with past trouble. So hopefully you join us on next Wednesday, which is St. Patrick's Day. And in case you didn't catch it in the beginning, I'm going to leave this up for a couple of seconds. All of our virtual presence, resources, social media, anything you need to know for SCF found right there at that link. Thank you all for coming. Uh, hopefully you enjoy your second half of the week of classes starting tomorrow. Hope you had a great night and I hope to see you all next week.